it's your girl Cheryl Lynn, and you're watching Speak the League on Alamo City Podcast Network. Hey, this is George Iceman Gervin, and you listen to Sweet the League. What is up, everybody? It is, what is it? Not Tuesday. It's Wednesday. Wednesday. Welcome back to Sweep the League. Rudy Campos Jr. I will be joined by the coach, Gio Gio himself, as well as uh, Derek Gervin. It's Wednesday, so Derek's back with us today. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to get into uh, some of your comments that y'all have left before. Uh, Tim Gonzalez definitely is leaving a uh, a question, a hypothetical question for Derek and Gio. We're going to get into that talk. Also, Miami Dolphins are talking about paying Tua $50 million a year now. We're going to get Gio and Derek's uh, thoughts on that because they were talking Dallas is paying Dak 60. Who's more worth it, Dak or Tua? We'll get into that talk as well. Storming the court. We've got Derek obviously on the show with us. Uh, we're going to get into storming the court. Good or bad, should they stop it? Jay Billis, we'll get into some of his comments of what he's talked about. And, of course, like we always do, we'll open up the vault. We'll start talking about some old-school NFL, old-school NBA. That just seems like something that you guys love to do here. Let's go ahead and bring on the rest of the panel. It's Derek. It's Gio. And let me fix the cameras as we are good now. Gentlemen, how are y'all doing on this beautiful Wednesday here in cold Cold Seguin, Texas, and Derek is going with the uh, yeah. the, the cowboy look today, man. <laughs> it. Wow, how you I'm guys good. doing, man? Doing well. How you doing, Gio? All both of you guys. I hope you're doing well. Pretty good, pretty good. I, I think I'm about to yeah. get my. Well, you know what? Must be nice <laughs> to get a shirt. Must be nice to get a shirt. I've asked Rudy. Hey, mm, I've asked Rudy actually? before to get me a shirt, mm -hmm. and I still haven't gotten a shirt. Um, you well, you sent me size five X, and I I was waiting till you wow. lost a little bit of weight. So, oh, you know, I, I've been hitting the gym like you, Rudy. So I, uh, I haven't hit the gym in a long time. I've actually gained like maybe fifteen pounds. So, and, and, I, and I have to tell him I've had this shirt now going on uh, two years from when we did the uh, show on uh, on the air radio, on the Rudy. Radio. You couldn't get me a shirt in two years? <laughs> My bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We can, always move on. we can always move on from this. We may need to talk about this after the show. You, know, What size do you need? I don't even know what size you need. What uh, size is it? Me, I'm tall, so give me a 2X. 2X. Okay. We will order. I'm making a notes right now. Geo, 2X. You will get Yeah. It. Like if I want to fit it, if I want to go for that, you know, new school, I'll get a medium and, you know. It's gonna be super tight, like so many people walking around. Uh, oh but no, two X should be fine. Two X, uh, but we'll good. see. All right. Well, Tim Gonzalez. Obviously, we got to get our our very very first comment always in is Tim Gonzalez's game day. Puto Blue Devils. It is game day for your Duke Blue Devils. Geo, um, and David's actually in here. It says the UT Tech game was rowdy, and it actually was last night. Um, you will get into some Longhorn Raider. Uh, doings from that game because that was kind of crazy. The Lubbock fans were nuts. Mark Halpern of the Sports Insanity Network will be doing a little bit of work with the Sports Insanity Network as time, as far as draft time comes up a little bit closer. This is Dak will get 60 and Dak for the future. I mean, again, we're, we're coming to the midst of the Tua talk because Tua is now they're talking about giving Tua like 50 million a year down in Miami. Uh, Tim wants him to beat Louisville, but nonetheless, man, look. We're gonna we're gonna start diving in here because we we want to get some NBA talk and before we get into storming the court because that's something we want to talk to Derek about before we get into the UT and uh, Texas Tech game because it's kind of similar uh, for the same thing because you've got UT Texas Tech last night you saw fans throwing stuff onto the court you saw one guy being dragged out of there a Tech guy so I mean you've seen a lot of that so I want to get into a little more discussion. On that in a little bit, but what I want to bring up here first is, gentlemen, Tim Gonzalez, very big supporter of the show. I appreciate you every time you're jumping on, Tim. He basically posts this question to us right here. We are going to look at a team of all-stars versus a team of another all-stars. He wants to know, if you take team 2021 
Team LeBron with Steph Curry, Luka Doncic, LeBron James himself, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and the Joker himself. Paired them up against, or put them up against 96 Eastern Conference All-Stars, which is Penny Hardaway, Michael Jordan, Grant Hill, Scottie Pippen, Shaquille O'Neal. What is the outcome of this game in you guys' opinion? Who wants to jump on this first? Well, I'll jump on it. Um, first of all, I'll say, Tim, thanks for being a part of the show once again. Appreciate you. It, it, it's what rules are we playing under? Um, if we plan under the rules of today, of course, I'm going to go with the, the Steph team and LeBron and those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we plan back in the uh, 96 in that time, I would take uh, Shaq's team. I think both teams are really good teams, but it would have to be – you have to tell me exactly um, are we going off of this year? Are they playing the 21st century basketball or are we going by 20th century basketball? Let's – you know what? Let's say we are playing – wow, that's a good one because, I mean, really the only difference we can talk about is what? Maybe hand-checking? You know, if we, if we were going to allow hand-checking uh, in this game. Say typical all-star fashion – Say this year's obviously these rules today, I would say. Well, because if you think about it, there's no hand checking, you've got guys like Jordan and Shaq that's kind of dominating right there. Well, if you look at playing in this era, I will go with the team with Steph because they, if you look at the size differential, uh, you have Shaquille O'Neal, but other than that, all you got is basically guys that are six, seven, and under, uh, Grand Hill and Scotty, mm -hmm. and then you got Mike and Hardaway, all about the same size. And then if you look at Steph's team, you got Lucas, who's 6'7 himself, if not taller, playing in the backcourt. And then from there, you got LeBron and Giannis and Jokic. So I think they would dominate the backboards. Uh, I would take the 2021 team playing in this era. That would be my pick, even though I'm going against Michael Jordan. But in this era, I would definitely go with Steph's team. There you go. Coach, man, what do you got, man, on this, uh, this hypothetical game between 2021 and 96? Well, you know, it's very interesting, right? Because as that kind of Derek laid it out, I mean, you got Shaq, Pippen, Grant, Jordan. I mean, listen, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, never normally want to not bet against uh, Penny. This is actually a tough one for me. Steph, obviously, is a, a bit undersized. Obviously, Penny owns that matchup. But, man, uh, if, if it's today's rules, give me the 2021 team. I mean... LeBron, Giannis, and Jokic, how serious are these guys going to take this game? That's also another thing as well. But knowing Mike, <laughs> I mean, he, he's going to come out guns blazing in this game. So it's interesting. Shaq can hold his own. Pippen, I think, could have a, you know, he's not as, as tall as Giannis. But I'm going to take the 2021 team. But, man, this is kind of a tough one here because – you got Mike on the other side, Penny and his prime, Grant as well. Um, and also Scotty, uh, though, you know, Scotty's been on this hating tour lately, which hopefully <laughs> we could talk about a little bit later on because I, I'm getting sick and tired of Scotty Pippen. But uh, we can talk about it later. But give me the 2021 team. 2021 team. Both Rudy, Yo, if, what's if, up? You, if you substitute uh, Barkley for Grand Hill, then that's a different conversation because then you're adding another guy who can score but can also rebound and uh, do a lot in the paint. With Grant, it's just looking at it basically a bunch of uh, small forwards and guards. And with the uh, if you put Charles on there, it kind of evens it out a little bit because it gives Shaq uh, some help defensively and on the boards. And you know Charles is a guy that could get you 20 rebounds a night. So mm -hmm. I, I like the lineup, but I just think it's not fair having two small forwards having Scotty and Grant, and then asking that question. If you had a power forward in there, like a Charles or a Tim Duncan or something, then we have a different conversation. Yeah, and, you know, would we say Charles from – We can also add Philly Carl Malone Charles, in there as well. Or the Carl, yes. What about – are we talking Charles from Philly or are we talking Charles in Phoenix? MVP e Charles? Either or is because he's, he's going to – one thing about it, you know, Charles is going to command that paint, that paint area. And so it'll just make it a little more – uh, I, a little more even for me on the boards because if you look at LeBron, Giannis, and Jokic, uh, just those three, that's a lot of rebound. And with Scotty and Grant, I don't think they would be up to it as far as dealing with those three big guys under the basket. 
Yeah, it's going to be an interesting matchup. I think, you know, honestly, I think Mike probably in this era, Mike would probably go for 60 easily <laughs> against this squad. I mean, if you're not going to be able to touch him, he goes for 60. I think Shaq is, Shaq is easily 20-20, I would say, in this game. But you're right. I mean, when you've got two small forwards with Scotty and Grant, that's a big mismatch when it comes to LeBron. That's what I'm Grant. saying. I mean, Scotty, with LeBron's size, Giannis' size, I just think they're going to overpower them to a, to a certain extent. Now, don't get me wrong. Skyder was a good defender in his day, but just the size over match, it just seems a little bit unfair. Who, whoever put this out, uh, this isn't really a balanced starting lineup. Well, you could also look, maybe take out Pippen, <clears throat> put in, you know, a David Robinson, right, at center. So you have two bigs there, right, against Giannis, not quote-unquote a big, right, but he is a, a bigger dude. David Robinson in the post with Shaq. I like that. Their chances there. So just a little bit more balance. But if you're going to post a bit, I mean, you can easily throw Tim in there. Wouldn't Giannis overpower Tim as far as, you know, on the perimeter? I mean, Tim was not exactly the fastest guy on the court. He's more crafty than anything. So could you put Tim, Tim. in there and, and take out Grant? You talking about Giannis overpowering Tim Duncan, or are you talking about Tim Hardaway? No, 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 no. Not. I guess, like I said, overpower is not the word that I should have used. But when I'm talking about Tim not being the quickest guy on the court, do you think Giannis has some kind of advantage with his speed? No, no, because Tim has a high IQ. He's not letting Giannis beat him with the uh, run into him with that left shoulder all night. All he's gonna do is make Giannis go left, and once we make Giannis go left. That's where the refs seem to come in and let him make all these four or five travel moves that he makes. But if you put Tim Duncan on there, he totally negates uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who can't shoot outside of five foot feet regularly. There you go. So Tim, Come on, be nice, Derek. Be nice. Well, I just have to be honest, too. Right? Giannis is a great player in this era. But, you know, uh, Gio, Giannis gets away with five travels a game, five charges a game, and maybe ten travels. So yeah. if you balance it out, I just have to be honest about it. I don't like some of the calls that these stars get away with because I don't think that they need to get away with extra stuff. They're the stars, so they shouldn't get extra um, help from the referees. And that and that's just not Giannis. That's all these guys across the board. Yeah, it definitely is, man. You know, that's this is one thing I like about the with talking about it because a lot of the you know listeners get into it and they bring up some of these scenarios. And this is definitely a good one. I think if you substitute. Uh, like we said, take out a Grand Hill, you know, and in 96, I mean, you've got other point guards you could probably go about other than Penny. I mean, what do you have? Like, you can easily go Steph Marbury. You can go Jason Kidd. I mean, there's a lot of other guys I would probably would have taken ahead of Anthony Hardaway. But again, you know, it is 96 Eastern Conference All-Star. So that's uh, that was from Tim Gonzalez. Tim Gonzalez, we really appreciate you always interacting with us here. It says Sweep the League, part of the Alamo City Podcast Network. Go to YouTube, search, search Alamo City Podcast Network. We're coming to you every Monday through Friday from 2 to 3.30. We are working on getting the mock draft guy himself, who just recently hit 10K on YouTube. So congratulations to the mock draft guy. Hopefully he is, um, you know, he's, he's going to be on tomorrow. He's working on it right now, so we'll get confirmation as soon as we do. We definitely and Tim's in here. Rudy's a hater for taking out Grand Hill. I didn't <laughs> get to take out Grand Hill. I mean, you guys were the ones that mentioned it. Before. I, I said I really that, did. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> it's always got to be a Duke thing. What is up with you, Duke Blue Devil guys, man? I mean, you Geo, especially you. Y'all always give me crap for hating on Duke, like every time. I don't need. I don't get that at all, man. At all. All right, man, we're going to jump on because this is a very popular thing. We haven't been able to talk to Derek about it, so we're going to talk right now, but. You know, one thing was storming the court, man. So last night you had uh, Texas and you had uh, Texas Tech. And, of course, you know, a chippy play happened and, you know, fans started getting involved, throwing stuff on the court. That was another real big mess that was over uh, up in Lubbock. Uh, we saw a fan being basically drug out, handcuffed and drugged out from uh, the stands. Prior to that, I mean, you had the incident in Dallas with Kevin uh, Kevin Durant and some fans. That was definitely um, uh, that's definitely uh, an issue. You know, calling the B word as he's running out. Not only that, before that, did you have Kyle Flipkowski from Duke? 
Uh, you saw the storm into the court. And again, I'm going to get into a comment that I have on that. And But you saw the storm into the court. Uh, knees were butted. Kyle basically got not injured. He's going to play tonight uh, when Duke takes the floor. But, you know, you have that incident before that. You have Caitlin Clark from Iowa, that whole incident. You know, she banged knees with the fan. It's got to stop, in my opinion. I mean, the, the Duke part, that part was kind of, kind of, I'm going to say it was dumb. I mean, because let's be real, man. I mean, both teams had a winning record. I mean, how is it actually you want to storm the court when both teams have a winning record? If you were like 0-15 and you beat the number one, number two team, I totally get it. But both teams had a winning record, and it made no sense to storm the court at all. But, you know, gentlemen, this whole storm of the court, I'm going to give you all the floor here on this because we're going to sit here what Jay Billis says in a second. But – yeah, it's just crazy. It, to me, it's got to stop. To me, it makes no more sense. I go back all the way when the remember Derek, the Celtics won the finals and they stormed the court, and you saw Larry Bird pushing and shoving, getting his way to the locker room. Gio, you remember the the video? Uh, who was it? Reggie Jackson when the Yankees won. You know, yeah, he was going crazy and pushing people. It's gonna take something like that to happen for them to really stop this. But then you go to the other part of it. As a player, Derek, you'll understand this. If fans are storming the court and you start punching and trying to get people away from you, what happens? You get a knock on your door the next day. You're probably going to get sued for it. But it clearly states, do not run on the court. Don't, you know, no interaction like that with players. Where are we standing on all this, Derek? Well, you already know, um, I've talked about it several times, even before these incidents this year. I've never liked it. Uh, I don't even understand what's the purpose. Why do the fans have to run onto the court? I'm used to fans. Why can't they do the same celebration in the stands? And I just don't want to see a tragedy occur. I just think it's insane when you, mm -hmm. especially in this era, we're in a different time now. And you know, your player, you can have people in the stands could be uh, drinking, they can whatever they on today. Um, you got drugs going, you got a lot of different stuff going on. And then when you just let people freely run onto the court, if they want to get out of player, that's the time to do it. And it doesn't yeah. seem like the players are being protected to me at all. And that's what I, I think is insane. Yeah. Um, someone if they could really give me a good reason why the fans even need to be out on the court in the first place is what I've always been trying to understand. And I'm one of those guys that believes in preventative measures. So I don't want all of a sudden after a tragedy happens, now all of a sudden everybody comes out and has something to say about these situations when they could be avoided right now. I don't like it at all. Never have. Yeah, to me, it just makes no sense whatsoever, man. I mean, you want to celebrate, celebrate. By all means, celebrate. But, I mean, Gio, it, it makes no sense for this to happen because, again, you could have that one incident where – Hey, I mean, I don't wish this upon anybody, but a fan gets on the court, you know, and they sneak something in, they, you know, do something to a player. I mean, this is player safety that we're talking about. And we've seen it at the pro level. We see it all the time at the college level. There's got to be something done in my, and I don't want to be old man on this and say, you know, stop it all. I totally get it. But in this case, even for the Duke case, man, both teams were above 500 winning programs. It made no sense for this to happen in this game in particular. Yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense. It's just very odd that this rule is still in effect for so many years. You know, I can remember, or not personally remember, but at watching the whole cow incident really where the band's on the field mm -hmm. and the football game is still going on, right? Like, we got a weird incident like that where the game isn't over, but the fans are storming the court. This is something that needs to end. And like Rudy said, both teams had good records. Like, it wasn't like Wake Forest was coming in and had three wins on the year, right, in the upset Duke, this was a fairly, you know, close records, and it needs to be done. This is it. I think it's time to get rid of this. And if you don't want to, have a rule in place where at least the players are gone from the court or some sort of rule where the players have left and or they're – it's just something that you have to be creative with the rule, but making sure that they don't get hurt. If a fan gets hurt, who cares? I mean, you're the dummy who's running, right? Yeah. But for a player to get hurt, it's just, it's not a good look. They got to figure this out. Either get rid of it or make sure players are out. 
So, okay, so the question that I pose to Derek first and then back to you, Gio, is this. We've all played sports at some level. Now, obviously, Derek's been at the professional level. You and I have played at the high school level, you know, probably at the most. I don't know if you have any college experience, but if you did, you know, it is what it is. But at any level, no matter where, as a player, as an athlete, if you are seeing fans storm the court and clearly, again, you buy a ticket to the game, you're entitled to your seat. You're not entitled to go on the court whatsoever unless, hey, a player says, hey, come on, you know, come celebrate or, you know, after the game they, that you shoot a free throw at Spurs games, all that kind of stuff. That's different. But as an athlete, do you have every right to protect yourself when something like that happens? Because, again, I say if you punch, if you hit, if you push and that fan gets hurt, they're going to come right after you. And everything's on video. They're going to say, well, clearly there's Rudy Campos. He pushed that fan. She hit her head. Busted her head open. You know what? She's in critical condition. We have to sue him. Is this where the league says, you know what? You want to storm it? That's basically enter at your own risk. No player, coach, whoever is responsible for what happens to you because their safety is priority. Should that be a part of every you know disclaimer that comes out when you buy a ticket? Yeah, no, I mean, that there should be a, a bunch of more disclaimers as well, which I'm sure there is, especially if you're buying on Ticketmaster and some of the other, you know, websites. But something needs to be done. The time is now, and the NCAA or whoever, whether it's the conferences that step up or whether it's the team uh, of their university, but it's second like college football where they, you know, try to take the goalposts down. It's like, dude, someone can seriously get hurt. Right, like it, it's a serious event. Football, like that goal bulls comes down, and you know it, it can seriously hurt someone. So in college basketball, the fact that this is still happening and it happened to an actual player, it needs to to get looked at. Look, this is a night. You know, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe this is in the old days. Like people can do a lot of crazy stuff when storming the court. They could have a a knife, right? They can do all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, and people can just dive at another player's knee. I mean, let's be yeah. real. You can you can injure somebody if you really wanted to. So, you know, and again, at the pro level with Derek, are you, should you be allowed to protect yourself as an athlete and not have the repercussions come your way? If, if a fan comes up to you, Derek, and they're storming the court and they are just on you, on you, on you, you should be able to protect yourself without penalty. Well, I went through some of that stuff uh, playing over in Europe. And the big thing for me is I don't even want to have to be put in a position to have to defend myself. That That's the key for me. Um, I've never heard a good explanation why they think it's so important for the students to run onto the court. You get enough. You're, doing, you're at the game. You're participating as a fan. You're cheering on the team. And that's to me, is where it should start and where it should end. The running on the court, I mean, this is not Pamplona, Spain, man, the running of the bulls. I mean, come on. Yeah. We're talking about human beings out here. And I don't <laughs> want to, and I don't want to be having to watch my back from all angles. And the yeah. sad thing is, I saw Tim made a comment about security uh this past weekend. There's not enough security you can hire when you're letting four or five hundred, six hundred people just run onto the court just randomly right after the game. They just rushing to the court. And there's not enough security you can handle um, that you could pay. And I understand they want the fans to have fun, but at some point we got to use what they call common sense. And to me, this is a common sense situation. I, if I could think of one benefit from the fans running on, to the, on the court, I would say that, or the fans running on the field. But I don't see any benefits from it whatsoever. Yeah, I don't see a benefit at all. I, I mean – I, there's celebration. I totally get it, but you're right. I mean, there's really no way to keep six, you know, 700 fans from running onto the court. There's not enough security. And, you know, we're, we got a comment here from Jeff Garcia, locked on Spurs. And he says, you know, Rudy, you think this will lead to the NHL style plastic wall separating the fans on the court? I mean, I don't think it'll go to that extreme to where you'll get, uh, you know, walls like that separating players. I mean, they still want to have players and fans to have interaction, but, I mean, truthfully, the NHL obviously does it right, but they do it more for protection of the fan because that puck can go in, which we've seen the puck go into the stands many times and even killed a little girl, if I'm not mistaken, one time at an NHL game. So, 
there, there's different reasons for that, but I don't think it'll ever get that far to where you'll see, you know, something separating, even though Jay Billis fellas made a comment and he says, you know, if they wanted to stop it, they could stop it tomorrow. You don't have to stop the court storming one time. All you have to do is once they're on the court, don't let them off. Just say you all are detained and give them citations or arrest them if you want to. And then the court stormings will stop the next day. Honestly, as much of a old man syndrome that I have reading Jay Billis's comment, I almost agree. You don't have to necessarily arrest them, but if you want to get on the court, we're going to cite you. We're going to basically give you a ticket and, you know, a nice five, $600 fine. That would probably stop a lot of these store court, you know, these uh, stormings of the court, because think about it. If you don't take care of a ticket, you start getting a warrant and it just kind of adds up and adds up and adds up. Are you that talking would about be yourself, a, I, Rudy? No, yeah, I, I don't have any warrants that I'm aware of, Gio. I hope, hopefully not. Knock on <laughs> wood. I don't have any warrants on that. But um, the NBA, they don't allow the fans to storm the court in the NBA. No, but they they have had instances where yeah. fans are on no, the yeah. court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, just like the NFL, they had the streaker in the Super Bowl. Uh, so which, what's by the, the way, he won a bunch of money off of that, by the way. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> but, but easily, what's the okay? What's the difference between NBA and college when it comes to storming the court? Do you think really think that the security at an NBA game would stop fans from running onto the court? There's the, the amount of security is probably a little bit more than a college game. So, what is the right? Well, in other words, what is the NBA succeeding at that you can't? do in college to keep it from happening that's the that's the bold question to ask about it because you don't see it in the nba no i mean there's there's really i've been in nba games really i could legitimately just run onto the court like there's no so one's gonna really people, stop you why are people scared to do it if if the san antonio spurs run or the detroit pistons on the historic you know 40 game losing streak and they win I, I mean, in, in Detroit, I mean, yeah, I mean, go back to the mouse of the palace, but nothing like that. But if they decide, hey, we beat the Denver Nuggets, the number one team in the league, why not storm the court? I mean, that's legitimately what college basketball fans do. It's celebration. That's the question that I had. Are, are all yeah. celebrations good celebrations? If they don't make sense, is it really a celebration? And then mm -hmm. when all you're going to be talking about later on is what could have been prevented. Uh, if someone could just give me a reason why they should be allowed to run on the court, then I might see a little differently. But I have never heard a good reason for fans having to run on the court. They, they can do just fine sitting in their seats or standing up by their seats. And no one gets hurt. And then at the end of the day, you don't have to issue citations or anything else. You just come and watch the game and then you go home. Exactly. And that's that's the point that I was trying to make, you know, earlier with the Duke and uh, the Wake Forest. This is what I'm trying to bring up right now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about a Wake Forest team that was 18 and nine. Duke was 21 and six. I don't know if that was at the time of record, but they both their winning programs in the ACC. So there made no reason. There was no reason to storm the court for this. It was just a, oh, we beat the Duke Blue Devils because why? It's the Duke Blue Devils. It's, you know, it's traditional basketball program. I mean, it's a successful one. That's the only reason why they did it. That's not a good enough reason. There's never a good enough reason to storm the court, like, at all, if I mean, if that's what we're talking about, Rudy, can I say this to you and Geo? Just something to yeah. think about when we talk about college. Yeah, here's another reason I don't like it. Okay, we know today there's a lot of gambling that goes on in sports, all right? Yeah. So we hear about that more now than we've ever heard about it before. So, me, if I'm a fan and I'm a guy that likes to gamble on games and I, we're playing against another team, say North Carolina, right? And then you, you, if I decide or we decide that we're going to run out on the floor and we were to intentionally try to injure one of North Carolina's best players, that's yeah. the stuff that bothers me. Because today, yeah. man, we, it's just a different era. And it's it, these kids today, some of them are very respectful, but then we got a whole lot of them out there today that aren't respectful and they want to just do things their way. And so I wonder about that. When you talk about gambling, if I'm a gambler, 
And if I was to go after one of the best players, I don't even want them to have that opportunity to do those things. And it's not like I'm talking like an old school guy. I'm just trying to talk with some common sense here. I don't want to see any players get hurt unnecessarily. And that's in the men's game or the women's game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the Caitlin Clark thing is kind of what set all this off. And then you see Kyle Flipkowski from Duke. That happened to him. You know, it just kind of gets – it's kind of getting old in a way. And the Gio was right earlier with the goalpost thing, man. That's that's kind of that's kind of ridiculous. Just tearing down the goalpost. It, it makes no sense because you've got a very heavy object, obviously, and you're tearing it down, and boom, we're we're done. I mean, you can have you know, you could possibly kill a student or two with you know that just coming down on them. Part of the college experience for students, only thing is students can be knuckleheads. Yeah, you know, it's it's part of the college experience, but it's a part that I know I don't like I really don't like the idea of anybody storming the court uh, or even the field in college football. I we saw that in a a UTSA (laughs) game uh, a year or two ago. It happened. Hey, Rudy, if all if all all you wanted to do is go to college so you could say I ran out on the court. That's 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 not (laughs) the great experience I want to have in college. You already get an experience. You're getting a lot of people are getting uh, academic scholarship and you go to the school there are people that getting uh, sports scholarships so that's part of the college experience going out there running on the court for no reason what kind of college experience is that i mean come on man we got to start thinking more about people's safety not just the players but the fans as well yeah exactly man you gotta it's both sides of the spectrum you've got to protect everybody when it comes to uh uh, the college experience. I mean, just storming the court, man. I think Tim had a quick question for you guys. Uh, would you sue Wake Forest's program if you were flip? Uh, flip. I hard to say, man. Hard to say. I mean, you can try to sue them, but again, I mean, can are they liable? Mm. It's hard to say if Wake Forest is even liable for it. I don't know. I, I don't think so. I, I think this is a situation that's obviously a player getting hurt with the storm court doesn't doesn't happen very often uh this is one in most recent memory at least that i remember so i don't think uh he'll he'll probably be able to i don't think he probably cares though i mean look if he if he tears his acl or you know what i'm saying like it, it, if it was something along those lines i mean potentially he could have a an argument though does he sue the school or does he sue the fan though the fan may not have a ton of money. So if I'm flip, I would go after the school for sure. You can go after the school. You can go after the fan. I mean, obviously the fan is what, I mean, that's what I'm saying. He bought a ticket for the game. You're aware that you're not supposed to do any of, you know, you're not supposed to disrupt the game in any way, beginning, middle, end. Uh, I mean, you could go after him, but again, you're right. The fan doesn't have anything. What are you going to assume for his heating pad in his, you know, dorm room? I mean, there's really not much a fan has. But what you could do is get – this is the part that, you know, I guess you can realize too is you sue the fan, you give the fan a record, and if they're trying to get into a higher position somewhere, that record does follow them. I don't know how – I don't know the legal part on all that, but, I mean, it could go that far to where well, it – follows them why, why not hold the school accountable i bet if they hold the school accountable the school will start thinking differently about that court storming because they don't want to be liable so maybe it is time to start holding the schools uh accountable for that kind of situation and i bet if you do hold these schools accountable i, I guarantee these incidents will become less and less yeah this guy because the school is the one letting them on the court rudy right that's like what the, i'm saying the schools are saying hey come on come on come on so it's it's sure the fan bought the ticket, but you're telling them to go on the court, so they're also liable. So you're saying that the school is allowing the fan to go on the court, which I can see that. Well, they are. I mean, I can see that from. But you know, the yeah, biggest no, thing because that we if they didn't want them there, Rudy, they would they wouldn't have allowed them. So then, is Jay right? If you storm the court, side them all, just block them in and side them all. I mean, that's in other words, if you have less security you know, blocking it off after they're on the court, you can probably control that a little bit better. They got to walk off the court at some point. I mean, they got to be able to do that. But then again, do you hire more security? This this is kind of a subject that's so hard 
to fix. It's not like an all star game or something where you make suggestions and stuff. It's well, hold the school accountable and you'll see a drastic change in the behavior as far as those. St- it seems like right now the schools, some of the schools don't take it very serious. Yeah. But if they, if they were starting to be hit in their pockets, we all know how that seems to change things up. And, uh, you know, the NCAA, man, they well, have pockets, to also scholarships. Job. Yeah, loss. Of, uh, yeah, t- AGO, whatever it takes. I'm with you. Whatever it takes to make this nonsense stop. <laughs> if they can come up with a better way to make things happen where the fans could run on the court, but the players are safe, maybe get the players from the visiting team off the court or something before all mm-hmm. of that, before they're allowed to run onto the court, things like that could make a difference. But until they do that, I'm, I'm all about doing away with it all together until they come up with a better plan. Yeah, they got it. And I like what y'all just said about losing scholarships, finding the the school. What would be a what would be a good fine? I mean, million dollars? Would a million dollar hit plus a loss of a scholarship be, you know, enough to stop a school to say, okay, we need to stop doing this. We're gonna have to find every way to protect the players. And again, we can go back to the what we said at the beginning. Rushing the field, you know, storming the court is fine. If you allow the players to get off first, allow the players to get off. That that is the main priority. If you allow the other, and it doesn't even have to be Wake Forest, allow Duke players and coaching staff to get off the court. And if you want to celebrate with your Wake Forest team and Dinky players, you can celebrate with them. But you have to allow the rival school to get off the court. Is that fair enough for what we can say is legit for that? If you want to storm the court, great. Just give them time to get off. For me, that's fair. Yeah, no, I mean, yep. That's that's kind of what we're going to have to do now. You know, everybody talks about the NIL deal, man. I mean, NIL deals, NIL just does a lot of, a lot of, uh, man, it's brought a lot of different changes to, uh, uh, this is get the student athletes off the field and then start. That's exactly what I was saying, David. You got to allow them to get off first. And it doesn't have to be the home team. Just allow the rival team to get off. Uh, I think Arkansas got fined for storming the court, possibly. So I need to look that part up. Schools cannot be charged because of mutual combat laws. Well, I mean, hey, if you want to start Mortal Kombat, we can start Mortal Kombat in college football and basketball. That's what it's got to (laughs) take for these guys to stop storming the court. This is Sweep the League. It's Derek Garvin. It's Coach Geo, Rudy Convos Jr. Again, we're all part of the Alamo City Podcast Network, Monday through Friday, 2 to 3.30. Go to YouTube, search Alamo City Podcast Network. Subscribe. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers. One guy that hit a thousand and times ten is a mock draft guy. We're trying to secure him for tomorrow's show to talk all things NFL draft. He's going to explain why Caleb Williams is good or isn't good when it comes to drafting him number one. Basically, uh, speaking of quarterbacks, man, we got to get into some quarterback talk we here. Got a serious conversation out the way, so how can go back to Texas now? Yeah, you can come back, <laughs> come back to Texas, man. We talked, Derek. We talked yesterday and the other day about one Dakota Prescott possibly getting sixty million dollars a year, resetting the quarterback structure. Now we get oh, the Miami Dolphins are talking about potentially 50 million dollar a year contract for Tua Tonga Viola. Now again, who's done more for their team? To me, they probably have done the same. Can we be can we be legit? I mean, I know Dax had a little more success than Tua, but with the team that's built around Tua, I mean, they're pretty much the same quarterback. I mean, but is one guy deserving of that kind of money than the other? This is, this is to me like you're just looking in a mirror. Literally, you got one left-handed, one right-handed. That's it. That's the only difference. Well, Rudy, it's not necessarily about who deserves. What does the market say? Right. Well, what what's the market going to run for? And right now, it's looking like fifty to sixty mil. Uh, for a year for a quarterback, Jared Goff's going to get an extension. I expect him to be potentially in that ballpark. Uh, but that looks like that's the range anywhere from 50 to 60 million. It's not what you're worth. It's how much they're willing to pay you and also what the market drives. So right now, quarterbacks aren't looking to go down. They're looking to continue to go up. And that's a lot of money. I mean, I remember just a few years ago when – Jared Goff got his deal from the Rams. I said, man, 25, 30 million, that's a lot of money. Now, 
50, 60, potentially 70 mil in the next five years. Look, when Tua came out, I was a fan of Tua. I still am a fan of his. Look, his arm isn't the greatest, but within that system, right, the system that they're running in Miami, I do think they need to get more of a power running game uh, to come kind of, kind of combat some of their kind of – There's like a king non- out there. Yeah. Well, yeah, like a n- non-physical style football that they play, very finesse. We saw in the playoff <laughs> game against the Chiefs, it just that finesse ball just didn't work out. Uh, mm-hmm. But look, the market says 50 mil. That's what you're going to have to probably pay him. Uh, if not, you're going to have to move on from Tua mm-hmm. and go elsewhere. Look, Kirk Cousins is out there uh, potentially seeking a new deal. Um, what do the Dolphins do? Do they go in the draft? I mean, they're going to have to trade. I mean, sign this guy. There's really no other thing they can do unless they do something unconventional which is get off a quarterback that they've drafted and go elsewhere but for right now that's what is expected the the same question not the same question but the same statement comes up over and over again and i i made it with the doc prescott you say 60 millions a lot man 60 millions a ton for doc prescott but there's nobody else out there you can go get that's going to make your team better outside of the main guys who are signed through 2029 and the the same thing for miami you're not going to go well we don't want to pay two of 50 million because we can go out and get so and so for 30 million well is so and so going to get you to the next level well no two it gives you the best chance to win right now you can't always blink and get a brock purdy to come in at you know a very 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 you know very good deal obviously mr relevant himself You don't always get that kind of, you know, magic happening. So you look at the field. Who else do I get? Well, two is the best we can do. So you're going to have to pay him, like you said. And that's why these contracts are going to be ridiculous. Man, can you imagine when Herbert, when Burrow, when, you know, Mahomes comes up again? You're talking in the upwards of, what, 90 probably by the time their contracts are coming up? 80 to 90 a year, do you? I mean, it's it's Well, look at Look at Baker Mayfield. What he's probably he's a little bit different, but he's probably looking at where 40 to 45 mil, right? I mean, and that's a quarterback, guys, that got released from the Carolina Panthers just what a year and a half ago. He got released. Yeah. He's with the Rams. Sean McVay really saved Baker's career. Then he goes to Tampa, makes a playoff run. Now Baker's gonna get a, a, a really good contract just a few years ago. We never thought he would get that money. So just the market right now and Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sh- I'm sure the quarterbacks are happy about it. The running back market, though, really is not Ooh. very good, right? So that, the running back market is okay. So the running back market is hot, but not as far as pay structure goes. Yeah, not as far as pay scale. But real quick, to Mario Cavazos, thank you for joining in. You know, Brock Purdy is signed up until 2025. He's only going to be making, I believe, 1.1 going into next year. So he's going to get an extension. He's actually up for an extension, I believe, this offseason. He can get one. So probably look for him to get paid uh, this offseason by the San Francisco 49ers. If, unless, and I'll bring that up, unless they decide to go another route, which I've heard <clears throat> some crazy stuff happening. But, Derek, you know, you're talking about Tua here. And like I said, we talked about Dak. There's really just you're just probably just gonna have to pay these guys because there's nobody out there, and there's really nobody in the draft that you know Miami's gonna be able to get where they're picking at as well. Well, we already saw this coming. I mean, when the Deshaun Watson was given his big deal, uh, he signed. So this is, and then you got Jalen Hurts. Uh, I knew Jalen Hurts wouldn't be the highest paid player in the league for very long. Yeah, and it only lasts what a few days. But yeah, this is what the market says right now. So unless you got an alternative, a better player that's out there somewhere, and uh, I don't know where they are because Dan Marino is not ready to walk through that door. So if Tool is the guy you're going to ride with, then that's the guy you're going to have to pay him. There aren't a lot of people walking around, even in the NFL, that are better than Tua. Yeah. So if that's what Miami is uh, banking on him for the next three, four, five years, and trying to see what they can get going with him and Tyreek Hill and those guys. Uh, yes, you have to pay the man. Uh, he actually had a really good year. And if you remember, uh, Tua was in, t- in the MVP voting yep. for most of the season. Yep. And then they kind of uh, fell off a little bit at the end. But, yeah, $50 million right now, I mean, he deserves that. He's a quarterback and a starting quarterback in the NFL. So if that's the guy you're going to ride with, yes, you have to pay 
Put your money where your mouth is. Well, to Derek, one more thing I want to say. Rudy did say that Daniel Jones would be better than Tua. Oh so I just wanted to throw <laughs> no, that I out did there. Not. He, he, no, he's I the one that not. said it. I'm pretty sure. No, I did not. On that I draft said, day, I that Daniel, Daniel Jones would be the best quarterback in that draft. I said Daniel Jones would be the better quarterback between him and Kyler Murray. That was my that was my draft I, night I, statement. I don't, I, I don't remember yeah. that, but Tua whatever. wasn't even drafted in the Daniel Jones draft. I thought Look, he was. was. Wasn't that with Herbert? That was the Herb. year Herbert was drafted. Was that the same draft? You need to look that up because I, my words were clearly that Tua, I mean, not Tua, that Daniel Jones would be the better quarterback out of this draft between him and Kyler Murray. And so far, I mean, so far that's been a wash because you can't even tell me which quarterback has been better. I mean. Okay, I was mistaken. Tua you. came out the following year, though I think yeah. Rudy did say that that Justin Herbert would be better than Tua, though. I am not wrong on that. I am well, not wrong on that. Even though Herbert hasn't won, uh, you know, very Herbert's much. Herbert's probably, yeah, Herbert's probably better. But nonetheless, yes. Rudy was singing the praises of Daniel Jones. <laughs> Which Daniel Jones actually might be on the move. There was a, a, an idea thrown out there that Daniel Jones, let me, I, you know what, let's talk about that here. Hypothetically speaking, someone made a comment and someone on uh, on a show actually said that it would make more sense for the New York Giants to trade Daniel Jones to the Cleveland Browns for Deshaun Watson. I scratched my head and it was kind of like those, hmm, hmm, wait a minute. Ho. Now the Giants get a quarterback like, like Deshaun Watson. They lose a quarterback like Daniel Jones, but Cleveland gets the benefit the benefit of Daniel Jones only having one year, thirty million left. So you get yourself out of a contract that you probably don't want when it comes to Deshaun Watson. You have Dorian Thomas Robinson there, so you've got a you've got a decent backup QB, you know, to just come in the year after Jones happens. I think that actually makes sense because you can also probably get like a second or third if you're Cleveland in that kind of move. So. I don't know. I mean, I saw, I heard that. What, what about P- Pittsburgh, Rudy? Pittsburgh's another team. I mean, to be honest, Pittsburgh's a quarterback away from you know. The reason I say, the reason I say that is because I'm still we don't. I I, I remember what uh, Deshaun Watson was before this injury, and as you know, it takes some guys after injuries. It takes some longer than it does others, and I'm still not giving up on Deshaun Watson. I thought he was playing well this year before he got hurt. And if you look at it, Cleveland was playing very well. Um, a lot of people started even putting Cleveland in the Super Bowl conversation. So I, I believe, I still believe in Deshaun Watson. Uh, Daniel Jones, not so much. So I don't know if I would want to make that move. And then that, and then Deshaun comes back and he gets 100% healthy. And then he starts putting up really good numbers again. And I've mortgaged our future basically for Daniel Jones, who um, I really don't believe in. I, I honestly don't think Daniel Jones is much better than Zach Wilson. That's just my opinion. Damn, well, I mean, that, that, that is a that's, kick in the balls right there. If you're converting, not very, you're not very Wilson, surprised. Man, I love that. I love that. I By actually, Derek's comments. Uh, I just, look, Deshaun Watson, as Derek said, look, just a few years ago with the Texas man, he was balling. And then obviously we know what happened. He had those issues, right? So, then he gets hurt this year, but I'm not sure if Brian Day. The thing about Brian Dayball is he's not a guy that is the most friendliest guy with the QB. Mm-hmm. He is rough around the edge. I, I do think he's a good coach, a good offensive minded coach. So interesting to see that. But I don't think the Browns. You're gonna say that your investment fa- like you're you're basically saying that your investment failed big time. You gave him a guaranteed contract. Yeah, I would. Do it again with Deshaun. Nick Chubb's probably gone. That's what it's looking like from Cleveland. So the backfield's going to, yeah, it's going to have to be restructured. Look, Nick Chubb with the Rams, I would love that. Um, You just want everybody to go to the Rams, dude. It's Hollywood, Rudy. It's not Atlanta. Come on. (laughs) It's Hollywood. It's not Atlanta. You know, I wish I was, uh, I wish I could find the podcast that I was on or the, it was on PFF Network when I was talking about Cleveland Browns and I made the comment and I pissed off a lot of Browns fans when I said, look, with this Nick Chubb injury, don't be surprised if he's not there next year. 
Th- this is a significant injury. It's the second one that he's had. The Browns are probably going to move on from him considering, you know, they have Jerome Ford, they have Kareem Hunt that they can get back. I mean, it, to me, it's it makes sense to move on from Nick Chubb. And I hate to say that, great player, but even you just admitted it right now, Gio, that it's probably a good thing, the good thing to move on from Nick Chubb. And I, oh, I made yeah. that I comment Nick has during been the season. A really good player. I mean, as everyone knows, I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan, so I saw Nick Chubb play Todd Gurley, AJ Green, Matthew Stafford, all, all the great dog players came through. So it, the end is near for him, but I do think he could still play, come back from injury and put him on a team, a contending team. Hopefully I, I, I don't want to see Nick Chubb on a team again. That's not doing anything with the running back market. It's going to be interesting, right? Saquon, where does he go? Where do we've talked about it? Do the Cowboys, do they take the plunge and get Saquon Barkley, right? Do they get an Austin Eckler, right? I do think the Cowboys could use a, an actual running back, not t- not no type of gadget guy that you know can do that. No, an actual running back. Where do these backs end up? Because I think that's can also tip, you know, the contender scale. Where do some of these guys go? I mean, look at the Jets, Brees Hall. You know, do they want to get Austin Eckler with Brees? Because Aaron Rodgers is going to come back, right? So, a lot of moving parts at running back. I'm really interested to see. Is it safe to say? And I'm going to make this this bold statement right now that the only team that only has maybe one legit concern, possibly two going into next season is the Detroit lions, how secure they are where they don't have to necessarily add pieces to continue to be that dominant team. They were this year. If they add anything, it's butter. It's just, you know, it's just icing on the cake from here on out. I've been trying to do a lot of research on a lot of these teams in the offseason. Now, I know your Rams are one, but my problem with the Rams is it's always going to be that defensive side of the ball. You know, Aaron Donald's getting older. Uh, they have some questions for me there. But with them, too, it's also the idea of Cooper Cup. I don't know if Cooper's going to actually be there going into next season with the Rams. That, that's, t- that's, for, that's a hard thing for me to say. So I don't know how they're going to look, but what I'm talking about Going into next season, the Lions, the way they look now is the way they're going to go in next season with the exception of a couple of changes here and there. That's where I'm thinking, like, this is one of those teams where you've got the running backs, you've got the line, you've got the quarterback, you've got the receivers. I mean, you've obviously got the tight end position with Laporta. The defensive side, they're losing, I think, one piece, but you've already had talks about possibly – uh, Chris Jones joining that Lions defensive front. You know, they're talking oh, about him oh, going oh, there oh. or Houston are the two teams that you got to watch when it comes to Detroit with Chris Jones. So Detroit, they can you add, sit up, Rudy. You yeah, they can, sit up in my chair. Oh, my goodness. They, and Gio, I'm not mistaken. And another thing is, you're talking about the Lions who are number seven in available cap space at 57. No, plus look, million. The, the Lions mean, got the money, that. right? But look. From year to year, things change. The Eagles were flying high. Fly, Eagles, fly, right? And look at that disaster, though. It's towards the end of the year. Every year changes. Sure, if you bring the same team back, the Tampa Bay Bucks. remember, they ran it back. Everybody came back for less money. Mm -hmm. And they didn't make that Super Bowl run like they wanted to. So it's important that in football, it's a little bit different, right? It's not like the NBA where, you know, yeah. For the most part, the Warriors are going to be a, a, a team contending or at least try to contend. But like a lot of those teams in football, the next year, a lot of things got to go your way. But you're right. Right now, the Detroit Lions, with that cap space and a real physical style defense, they run the football. They got the receivers there. Detroit looks like a team that entering next year, I still like the 49ers. Of course, I'm the Rams. So I, I'm, you know, I'm a pull for them to see what the Rams do this offseason with a bunch of their money they have but the lions are going to be a team right there in the thick of things and for a fan base that has been and i'm sure Derek knows for a fan base that has gone through it all two 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 (laughs) two players retiring in their prime and Mm -hmm. you know i know flint is not the drone but flint michigan issues and all this other stuff uh it's good to see detroit have that and you know, obviously, Michigan won the championship this year as well. So, uh, a big up and coming. We just need the Pistons now, Derek, to 
get their act together over there. They're but they've been playing it. hard, though. They've been playing hard lately, though. I, I hope I put a positive uh, spin on them when I met all the guys. Hopefully, I in the sad because one of the guys I talked to, he's uh, being moved, uh, Mike Muscala. I had actually talked to him this past weekend, and now I see he's on the move out of Detroit. So I want to wish him well. Uh, whatever team he ends up on in um, in the near future. Yeah, man, that's what we're talking about. Detroit, the Lions, I think, are that team. And now, I mean, I I I picked them before this season. They were my Super Bowl dark horse all year, and they came. They were there. They were there. Now going to the next season, they're not a dark horse. They're but it, not a, is a Jared Goff? Player. Is Jared Goff? Can he take you to the promised land? Mm, that's the question because that's he's tra- he that's he tough. traded the rams traded him right he took the rams to the super bowl i'm grateful mm. there were a lot of missed throws in that game we could talk about that another day but he goes to detroit he gets in the championship game couldn't get the job done now he wasn't the only issue there are a lot of things that happened in that game uh that caused detroit to lose but it is the question is that team is ready is jared Goff? did that to me is is he that guy that's going to win you the whole thing? Because if Jared Goff wins a Super Bowl in Detroit, he's a made man forever in that city, and you're bigger right. than Matthew Stafford when it comes to a Detroit level, at least. Yeah, you're you're right on that. And you know what? Hold that thought. We're going to take a quick commercial break here uh, for Sweep the League. It's Derek Gervin. It's Coach Dio. It's Rudy Campos Jr. We'll be back here in just a minute to see will Jared Goff lead him to the promised land. I've got a little interesting. Uh, Take on that. We'll be right back in one second. Locked on Spurs is your daily Spurs podcast hosted by Jeff Garcia, the lead Spurs writer for Ken's 5 San Antonio. Jeff has a healthy plethora of guests all the time on the Locked on Spurs podcast. You can also follow Jeff on threads at Jeff G Ken's 5 SA. You can also follow Jeff on Twitter at Jeff G Spurs Zone. So make sure you go ahead and give Jeff a follow not only on threads and twitter but also on youtube at youtube.com forward slash at locked on spurs this is where you're going to be able to find the replay of the locked on spurs podcast make sure to like subscribe and share that is jeff garcia at jeff g spurs zone on the x not twitter it's on x so you can follow him there thank you jeff uh, locked on spurs i i come on that show uh almost once a week but uh definitely de- take a look at locked on spurs oh we know you're a big timer now i mean no, we get it you're a big far timer. It. i'm far from it i'm i'm the sixth man when it comes to locked on spurs i get the call it's late at night to come on but nonetheless man you <laughs> you brought up the jared goff thing so it's kind of funny that you bring that up because Super Bowl Rams, Jared Goff, first timer, you know, just I think that was more of a one of those. I'm happy to be here. I made mistakes. I'm learning from mistakes. No, 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 I learned from mistakes. It, it was one of those that I felt. But the Rams definitely should have won. You know, that, that should have been a victory. I'll well, say that much. If Todd Gurley is Todd Gurley. And remember, people forget Cooper Cup tore his ACL. He was out for the year. Yep. To me, if Todd Gurley's there, Cooper Cup and Todd Gurley at his apex, I'm talking 27 touchdown Todd Gurley. If Todd is there and Cooper Cup is flying, I find it hard to believe that the Rams do not win that game. I think the Rams win that Super Bowl. Uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And there were a lot of memes. The Rams didn't even score a touchdown in that game. Yeah, and you know, I get it, and that's what I'm saying. I, I that was more of a that was can you say it was more like a fluke that Super Bowl for Jared Goff. Now, getting back with Detroit, more experience. I think he yeah. still has the same explosive offense that he had in it with the Rams. It, it's I mean, probably it's probably better. Yes, to that's what I was gonna extent. say. It's about the same explosiveness, but it is probably better. You have a lot of cap space, you have draft picks, something that we know the Rams were were not without like for a long time, but you also have that defense and you have the most important thing that he had with the Rams, Gio, you have the right coach and staff. This is why I think that Jared Goff can lead the Lions to a Super Bowl win and give them that type of that title they need. 
you know, their coach is a little, little janky for me at times, right? <laughs> I, I think we all can agree. Campbell doesn't always make the best decisions. He does mean well, and, and I think he's a guy. To me, Dan Campbell, he's a leader of men. When I see Dan, I said that that guy is a leader, right? X's and O's and all that stuff. Look, there's probably better offensive, defensive-minded coaches, but when you're talking about a leader of men, that is Dan Campbell. Decision-making at times are kind of up and down, but that's okay. That's how football works. I do think that Jared Goff can get it done. Um, he's grown a lot. Mm-hmm. He's not the Jared Goff with the Rams. So to, to answer Rudy's question, at least for me, I do think that Jared, he has it. And the window, guys, is probably two years. Because that window, you know, it closes, it opens, right? It closes, it opens, right? Joe Burrow, that window closed, but it's it's going to reopen again for the Bengals, right? So uh, mm-hmm. give me about two or three years for the for the Lions to see if they can punch that ticket and win the whole thing. You ready, Derek, for a Super Bowl win in the Lions in Detroit? <laughs> I was ready uh, when we were pulling the Bruno Mars on the 49ers at halftime, 24-7. Yeah. So it just, um, you know, I think Jerry could lead us to the Super Bowl if we were to get back in this situation again. But you both of you guys know how hard it is to get back. Um, there's been so many players that have gotten there one time or gotten close to the Super Bowl, and they started talking about the following year and what's going to mm-hmm. happen. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, it's like guys just fall off a cliff. Yeah. I believe in Jared, uh, but those guys that were dropping those passes, man, to me, that was the biggest issue. It's like the team panicked when they started the third quarter. And, of course, uh, Gio said some great things about Dan Campbell. Uh, I love Dan Campbell, but uh, some of his situations, the situations that he makes um, with these um, fourth and ones or whatever yeah. are kind of questionable yeah. to me. And, you know, I felt uh, when it comes down to the final four, when you go down to the final four, uh, talking about getting to the Super Bowl, you have to make all these smart plays. Mm -hmm. And that comes with the coaches coaches as well. And I just think uh, the Lions, I believe in Jared Goff, but I'm more concerned about Dan Campbell uh, maturing as a coach. And uh, when the game's on the line, I'm more worried about him than I am about Jared Goff. Uh, I I believe in Jared Goff, and I believe that, yes, he could be capable – of leading the Lions to a Super Bowl if we were to get back in that situation again. Yeah, and I, I like the fact that we're talking about Dan Campbell because clearly, in my opinion, this whole season was on Campbell's shoulders at the end against the Niners. I mean, there's – to me, you know, it's a different game if you don't leave points, you know, on the field, as was the case with the field goals. I mean, you – you in the regular season, you take all the chances you need to get victories because you need them. I get that point. But like Derek says, when you're in the final four and you're on the way to making that Super Bowl run, you every point counts, man, because you just never know. You know, you can think back. We didn't kick that field goal. We lost by a point. If we would have just kicked that field goal, could it have been different? Possibly so. And that's that's where I think Dan learns this season. And that's why I say the growth for Dan Campbell and Jared Goff, the growth for this Lions team, it's actually beneficial because – they learn from that mistake and they learn from this season going into next season. We're not going to see, you know, another, uh, another type where, you know, I mean, it's not going to be like a Falcons thing where they go to the Super Bowl, crash and burn. And then wait, 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 team anymore. The, the Falcons <laughs> did make the playoffs though, already the following year. They were in the mm. thick of things. And, but to Derek's point, look, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to win a Super Bowl. Look, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, store of the football, Dan Marino. He went to a Super Bowl. I'm pretty sure Derek probably thought, oh, yeah, Dan's going to be back, right? Yeah. yeah. And Tan was never back again. But you have Jim Kelly go four straight years, and he was blessed, but they never won, right? So a lot of things got to go your way. A kick here, a missed kick there, a block kick. I mean, look at the Chiefs, right? The Chiefs blocked that kick in the Super Bowl. How important was that? That, that was one of the most important plays of the game was a block kick. Yeah. The little things are always the things that get you, especially in the postseason where the game, it gets can smaller, you, tighter, and it's just a tough to win. Can you remember back when the Buffalo Bills went four straight times? how dominant the NFC East was because they lost to an NFC East every single time. 
They lost twice to the Cowboys, the Giants, on Norwood, and then it was the Reds. Well, at that time, the Redskins, sorry. So, but I mean, those that NFC East division was just ridiculous back then because you're talking Washington had Mark Rippin, Art Monk. Uh, I mean, that then, you know, I mean, they just had the, the offense back then. The Cowboys were the Cowboys. I mean, you're talking, you know, Troy and Emmett and those guys, and then the Giants and the Parcells. Days. Let's be real. It was wasn't it Hofsteller? It wasn't Phil Sims at the time because Phil was injured. <laughs> Jeff Hofsteller. Yeah, Jeff Hofsteller. That's I mean, the thing about losing four straight, lose to one division. People probably don't remember, but if you look at statistically, that Redskins team, man, they can run the ball. Just a, mm-hmm. a team that can go up and down. And Derek probably remembers the Redskins What's... blew out the Lions in the NFC Championship game. I mean, they dem. Demolish totally them. Demolish them, yeah. Totally demolition. Who was the running back? Was it Ernest Biner? Or no, Biner was... No. It was... Um, I got to remember offhand. I can't remember who the running back was the at the tip time. of my tongue, but... Because I know, lose- they had, I know they had Art Monk at receiver. Uh, I believe Sanders was a receiver there. Oh, uh, man, I can't remember offhand who the running back was. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that Washington team was... Oof, I, I was... That was a really good team. And I, I even brought up a while back about the Oilers from back in the day with Warren Moon and Haywood Jeffries and Ernest Givens. I mean, the electric slide. That, listen, that, listen, that, that <laughs> those Oiler teams, especially in that, that one there, that, that oh was God. probably one of the better teams to never win the Super Bowl. I mean, Warren Moon was yeah. – he was electric. He could sling it. And they had that lead against the Bills. And then the Bills end up coming <laughs> back and – Ah. Frank Wright was the quarterback that game. Yeah. Kelly was out. Frank Kelly Wright, out. Out, former head coach. Um, and But to get to four Super Bowls, Derek, I, I got a question for you. What do you think that does to not just your team, the coaches, the fans, but to the leaders oh. of that locker room to lose four straight? And I saw the doc on Netflix. They talk about it and, you know, they felt like they were the better team in all four Super Bowls, but hey, at the end of the day, they didn't win it. But what do you think it does to the leaders of that team? It, I mean, it is devastating. Uh, you know that, man. You, it, it just takes away your confidence. Four years and you come up short all four years and four years in a row. It's hard to teach guys to get over that because you start getting into the Murphy's Law thing. Uh, whatever can go wrong will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's how I started feeling. Um, I was a fan of the Bills and all four of those Super Bowls. I'm a big fan of Jim Kelly's. And to see them just get there like that, Gio, every year, man, I was a Bruce Smith fan. I can go on and on. Mm-hmm. And, and they were talented. Them, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just hard. For, you know, you can see the organization still hasn't recovered from that. They had yeah. the talent. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Smith, it's the running like, back. So, Gio, let me ask you, don't you think if you get that close four times in a row, some of that has to do with the decision-making that the coaches made at some point during the games, right? Um, We know the one year Scott Norwood missed the 47-yard kick. But during those games, it has to be something that Buffalo could have done a little better uh, at some parts of the game to make things go their way. And, man, I mean, it would be devastating if I was a player in that locker room. (laughs) I'm happy that we got to four Super Bowls, but to not get over the hump, man, that, that is something devastating. And, and I don't know how you can help the players uh, mentally to get over something like that. Well, yeah. in watching the doc, you know, they, they talked about the Redskins game, and apparently um, they're running back Thurman Thomas. He, he lost his helmet. Someone took his helmet by accident in the first series. And they talked about how, you know, that was the the whole experience for that Super Bowl. It all went downhill after he came back in the game and they could never recover. And I think to myself, wait, you mean to tell me your star running back loses his helmet so you didn't do well the first series and the team never recovered? It, it, it To me, also coaching obviously yeah. plays a big part in that because to lose four straight – what do you tell your players? I mean, and the Cowboys teams were, I mean, and those games weren't, there's only really one game that was close. I know one of the Cowboys games in the first half was close, but I mean, the the Redskins one is is really the 
and then the, the Cowboys' second one was just terrible. It's like, I mean, as much talent as you had, you couldn't just win one, just, just one. Like, if you go one for three, we probably never remember, right? But no, you, mm-hmm. you go 0 for four, and they beat up on the AFC, right? I mean, they they beat the Dolphins, right? They beat um they beat the Raiders in the AFC championship game. They would dominate these teams in the AFC, but at the time, the best conference was the NFC, and it, it, it wasn't even close because you had the 40. Remember this, the 49ers, they blow out the Chargers in the Super Bowl, right? The Chargers beat the Colts in the AFC championship game, and, I mean, look at the Packers won. It was to the Broncos, right? Terrell Davis and them finally break through uh, yeah. to beat the Packers and then uh, Rudy's Lonely Falcons, which, honestly, Rudy, if the Vikings get to that Super Bowl, I would have Vikings. loved to see that Vikings team against the Broncos. The Vikings team actually win because hey, don't you yeah. Gio, don't you guys think Jim Kelly suffered more than anybody out of those Super Bowls? Oh, yeah. Because oh, if you, yeah. you never hear when they talk about the greatest quarterbacks, you never hear them mention Jim Kelly even in the in the conversation. And just think one championship changes the whole trajectory of his career. Uh Bruce Smith, Cornelius Bennett, and all those guys. Still got all the accolades that they deserve, but the one that seems that got hurt the most was definitely Jim Kelly. Because if Jim wins four, he's he's definitely in this. I mean, he's there, right? You have Montana, him. Though Jim would have won more than Montana, he would have had four and oh, he would be probably below Tom Brady. He goes over Drew Brees for sure, right? Oh yeah, he no, he two, he goes over Drew Brees. He's over Drew Brees. He's he's over Peyton Manning though. I think Payne's a better player, but still, like he goes all over these guys, and he's at least second with four straight Super Bowl wins, a dynasty for sure, one of the most probably unique dynasties. And and even if he gets three, he he's still there. I mean, he's still in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, Jim. Just- I'm saying I'll say this much, and I've I've said it before. I'm gonna say it till I'm six feet under and no matter if the Bills won those Super Bowls or not, I still consider that Bills team a dynasty. I mean, to get to four straight Super Bowls is something you will never see again. There's no way you're going to see a well, team get there's to a four man straight in, Super Bowls. There's a man in Kansas City who who could change that, Rudy. He could. He could. But, you know, the, the part two is that the injuries. I think the yeah. injuries are what's going to have to play a key because no, yeah. for the most part, those Buffalo Bills teams were pretty healthy the entire time. Yeah, you know, Jim bad. did go through some injuries. And, I yeah. mean, look, there's definitely going to be Knicks, but to get to four, the Giants was the one. That was the one. That was one. the one that they should have won. They, there was the no one they reason they should have won. Not. The Redskins, yeah. no. The Cowboys, The one of the Cowboy games, it, it was kind of back and forth in that yeah. first half, but that's – that's the one they honestly should have won. And kudos to Bill Belichick. He was a defensive coordinator against the Bills, and he talked about how trying to essentially slow that game down because the Bills had the no-huddle offense. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's and the one know, there. I, I'll tell you one player I used to watch a lot, and I I remember collecting his football cards from Buffalo Bills, was Daryl Talley. I, I used to love yeah. the way Daryl Talley played, man. Daryl was awesome back then. Man, that's the thing. I would I consider even though they say dynasties require championships, I don't think so. I, I consider Buffalo a dynasty in that era. I mean, but they the only time Buffalo was, I guess, scared when it came, or not scared, but close to not making the Super Bowl in that run was against the Oilers. I mean, they literally ran through, like you said, the AFC, and they mowed them all down. But that Oilers game, I think, was the only game that really put a scare in it. It would have been nice to see Warren. Now, I know it wasn't the AFC Championship game, but it would have been nice to see Warren Moon in the Super Mm -hmm. Bowl against the Cowboys, right? Uh, But unfortunately, because on the NFC side, that team was always prepared. Why? Because they had to play the Packers, right? They had to play the Eagles, with that defense, you had to play all these teams, and I'm over here naming NFC East teams, but the 49ers too, right? Like, yeah, play all these teams to get through. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the Bills are basically like, running through these boys left and right. Yeah, and I mean, they, they beat the Raiders one game like 40 to to like something or something like that. So the competition, unfortunately, was but pretty much I remember, lacking. I remember watching AFC games and. 
I, I will have to go on a limb here and say, you know, being that I was a Falcon fan, yeah, we had great times back in, you know, 80s and 90s. But one AFC team I used to love watching, you probably scratch your head, was the the Cleveland Browns, man. I was a big Bernie Kosar. Yes, Bernie Kosar. And that was Ernest Biner. Um, you're talking also Webster Slaughter. I remember I used to love watching Webster Slaughter. I, I mean, the team that the Browns had back then was just rugged. I well, you know that it. it was they just, had that one I run, right? When Bill Belichick was the head coach, they had yeah. Eric Mangini on the staff. I believe mm-hmm. Nick Saban was on the staff. A lot of great young coaches, and I think they ended up beating the I think they beat the Patriots in the in the first game, and then they ended up losing Denver? in that second. Was that the Elway Drive? I think that was the Elway Drive, wasn't it? No, I think that was in the in the eighties though. But the one time in the nineties though, mm, okay. the one time in the nineties where they got a run, they lose to Bill Part or they beat Bill Parcells, which is kind of ironic, and then they end up losing. But yeah, those uh, a team of mine that I did enjoy watching were the Eagles just because of their colors and also the Packers as well. Reggie White was just man, that was a phenomenal. I mean yeah. his. His hit, man, that little club hit. Man. <laughs> yeah, that. And then he would pray for you. It, you know, it's like, what an amazing thing. The guy would beat you up and then pray for you after the game, you know? But Sorry, that was Reggie. It? Hey, Derek. So, I mean, going back in the 80s and 90s, we're opening up the vault here on NFL, man. Besides the Lions, I mean, who were you watching coming up in the NFL? Because you're going to say, first and foremost, we're fans of our teams. We're supporters of our teams, but we're also we're also fans in general. We used to watch players like God, man, this guy. My my dad used to always talk about Marino, how he would throw the ball. Yeah, he would throw the ball, and before the receiver could turn around, the ball was right there. I mean, I'm that's that's precise passing. You, you made that easy for me because I'm a damn Marino fan, and then Mark Duper and Clayton. So that was I was a big mm-hmm. Miami Dolphin fan, and. And I enjoyed uh, rushing home. It was kind of like when Jordan was playing with the Bulls. You remember how people used to rush home to see the games? I was the same way when uh, the Miami Dolphins were on the air. Uh, I'm, I'm to this day, uh, Dan Marino is my favorite quarterback. So when I just saw him with Duper and Clayton, uh, that would be it for me. Uh, I've always been a Dolphin fan. I was a fan when they had Bob, uh, Bob Greasy. And so oh, I've yeah. always been a Dolphin fan. But if you bring up Dan Marino, that would be, for me, out of all football, that would be my team. I would be that team with the Marino and um, the Miami Dolphins, Duper and Clayton. Think about this on Dan. His second year, he threw 48 touchdowns, which to me, in the 80s, right? And we talk about defense, right? 48, the the football. <laughs> 48 <laughs> touchdowns 48 touchdowns in the second year. Mm-hmm. In a time where you weren't, I mean, look, there were teams who were throwing, you know, the Chargers with Dan Fouts, right, and some other teams as well. But it was a running man. League. His second it year, was it was a running league for the most part, with a few other teams who would throw it around. But man, like Dan Marino, if you go look at his spiral, was was just unbelievable. Man, he yeah. could just throw a perfect football. Gio, can Rudy, can I ask you two guys quickly? Um, better yeah. quarterback, uh, Dan Marino or Aaron Rodgers? Marino. I'm going to go with Dan Marino, though. Look, Aaron can make any throw. He he can run. He can throw it and just different style games to a certain extent. But I'm going to take Dan just because, man, that and Dan had probably. Man, it's, just, it's just crazy. That he only made one Super Bowl, man. One Super Bowl. That's crazy. Yeah. I would it's just crazy to me. It's funny because, you know, you mentioned Marino or, or Rogers or anybody. I'm I'm the type of guy, and again, I'm going to be wrong by 95% of America on this, but I would take Dan Marino just about over every quarterback. I don't care what accolades they have. I don't care what MVPs they have. I don't give a damn about anything. I would take Marino over just about every quarterback with the exception, and it would kind of be – you can make a case for it. I would put him right underneath Brady, 100% underneath Brady. I don't even think – if I was to say stat-wise, I mean, I think what Marino did with less in some instances than Brady, I would probably take Marino over Brady 100%, making him the greatest quarterback of all time. That's my take. 
Is it a hot take? I have no idea, but I would definitely. Well, it, it's probably a hot take just because I think people would say, well, Dan doesn't have the championships. Exactly. And, exactly. And I think that's probably what, and that's what we talk about with other athletes. Carl Malone, right? Yeah, but Carl didn't win a championship. Patrick Ewing. I, I'm someone who's from New York, right? So I grew up with Patrick Ewing and those fans and, you know, the Nick fans could be very, and I'm sure Derek knows, could be very, very insulting and unforgiving. But Patrick Ewing, they should get that guy a lot of credit. But anyway, there are so many guys who didn't win a ring, but that shouldn't, look, it's hard, man. It's a team sport. This isn't tennis or golf where it's an individual sport. It's a team sport. A lot has to go your way, and it didn't work out for Dan. I, I did hear a comment from uh, their former coach, uh, and I think it was Don Shula, who said, and we should have we should have given him more help. He he should have had more help, especially on defense. Uh, but as Dan got older, what his his injuries kept piling up, right? So Dan had bad knees. So um, it's it's just unfortunate. So many guys to and to not win a Super Bowl, but it, it's hard. I mean, look at this. Joe Flacco has a Super Bowl. Right. We don't think much of him. <laughs> and, and you do, and you and you do suffer. And I, I, I know from experience because Gio, I know you're on about thirty three or something. I know you're young. Yeah. Uh, I used to go, and my, you know, the Spurs won five division titles when my brother was playing. Yeah, but they ran into a group called Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, <laughs> James Worthy, etc. Mm -hmm. So they they were never able to get over the hump, and it does alter your career. Um, a lot of times I see these conversations about the greatest guards and my brother's not in there. And I can't get upset with that because a lot of times people only remember if you get that one ring, one ring, it puts you over the hump. And that's yeah. something they can never take away. And then your career ascends a lot from there. So I can kind of feel uh, with the Spurs. I can know what Dan Marino went through. Um, yeah. I hate to see Jim Kelly go through it. And you can prove how it could change your career because if you really look at it, I'm not a big Eli Manning fan. Never uh, have been. I'm um, not. Hey, I'm you not. Know, <laughs> well, you know, I, I played in New Jersey, so I know about that area in East Rutherford. But just winning that one or two rings, it cements you forever in infamy, basically puts you in infamy. So I was sad to see those guys uh, not get a ring, but, hey, it is what it is. What well, to, to Derek's point, I mean, look – before Tim Duncan got there as well, D David Robinson, right? I mean, he was having flames out in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. You know, he had the year against yeah. Elijah Wan. The Spurs won a bunch of games, right? But the knock on them, Derek, was, hey, they can't make a run, right? David just couldn't win. So just imagine David Robinson never winning a championship. I do think we think of him probably very differently. And, you know, like I'm sure so, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, though dude. the New York media is actually more unforgiving than probably in San Antonio. Gio, they are cruel. The they yeah. are cruel when it comes to Pat Ewing. <laughs> Man, Pat yeah, Ewing is the first guy to ever block my shot in the NBA. And I play with the Nets, but I'm going to tell you this, and I was a big Pat Ewing fan, and it's sad today that um, he doesn't get the just do that he does, that he deserves. Yeah. Yeah. I have him as a top 10 center. Uh, oh, yeah. I, can't see, I can't see that changing in my lifetime, and it's just sad how some of these guys don't get the recognition they deserve because they weren't able to bring it all the way home and get that ring. Look, he ran into Michael Jordan. How many guys don't have rings, Derek, because of Michael? And he also ran into Hakeem, which was playing out of his mind. So, Patrick, to say, you know, for the New York fans over there, and I've talked to, to so many New Yorkers over the years, and they always got something to say about Patrick. I'm like, look, the guy gave his life for this team and for this organization in this beautiful city. And unfortunately he ran into the goat and he ran into Hakeem just having a, a monster 94 season. So. And he ran look. into an unbeatable Spurs team. In that yeah. Yeah. Hey, really, yeah. And you, both of you guys know, if you take Ewing off of those teams, they're not even a playoff team. Mm -hmm. no. nope. And that's what I think people get carried away sometimes, man. If you take Patrick Ewing off the New York Knicks, we're talking about a lottery team. Mm -hmm. So get a man his flowers while he's alive. Uh, he's had he had a great career. Uh, Dan Marino had a great career. All these guys, whether they won titles or not, to me they're champions. No, yeah, and Charles, you know they always joke around with Charles. Bar Listen, Charles in his prime was a load, man. That dude could play, and I know some NBA players now will you know 
kind of point at Charles for never winning a championship and, oh, you did a super team with the Rockets. But look, Charles in his heyday, and I'm sure Derek saw it firsthand, that guy could play. And he wasn't the tallest guy, right? But he used his leverage very well, could really understand the game. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that me and Rudy agree with. We don't agree well on anything, but that that <laughs> ninety three that ninety three Suns team, man, I, I felt that was probably the team out of all the teams that Jordan played that in the finals. Cool. Listen, the Jazz were good, but Carl Malone's free throw shooting at any games were terrible. I thought that was that was the team, the Suns team with Dan Marley, Kevin Johnson, and a buttload of players they had. That that was the team to get the Bulls. Yeah, yeah someone, you know, you know, I had someone tell me that Charles Barkley wasn't a leader, and all I could do was laugh because I'm like you, Gio. <laughs> all I had to do was go back to those Phoenix Suns teams. It sure looked like he was the one leading them to me, and it culminated with him getting the MVP, if I remember correctly. Was the, the MVP? Was the, go ahead. Was the was the person that told you that, Dirk? Was he from San Antonio? Because if so, then he's probably still pissed off that Charles closed down the Hemisphere. Arena. <laughs> well, that, that's what I was going to say. It's you know the shot heard around San Antonio when Charles pulled up. But hey, don't remember man, though. I love. You know what? That is my number one Charles Barkley moment ever. Was when he shut down Hemisphere Arena. I was watching it on TV. David was guarding him. Charles at the top of the key. I turned to my dad and I said, dad, he's about to hit this. Sure enough, dribble, 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 step to the side, take the shot, game over, close down the hemisphere. All you remember is Charles just doing the punch in the air like that. Yeah, that was a great moment for him. But look, Charles also, he could have got to another finals. But unfortunately, Hakeem and those Rocket teams were at that time better than the Suns. So the Suns were up in both of those series. And mm-hmm. the Rockets end up coming back to win. So, look, Charles had to go up against some – we all can agree. The 80s and definitely in the 90s, the big man, you had to go through a lot of guys. Every night you're playing Matumbo, you're playing Patrick, you're playing Carl, right? Even though you might not be guarding them, you're still in the game playing them, right? You're playing, obviously, Michael Jordan, Hakeem, all these great guys, Alonzo Mourning, right? So – it was a tough sled. That's why I'm glad we talked about yesterday, Derek, that the NBA is considering some rule changes to help uh, bring in some defense. As the NBA, we've seen Derek, ain't nobody playing defense these days. So I'm hoping hey. the NBA can bring back maybe the hand check rule or something. Hey, hey can we cover that the next show? Hey, Rudy, I want to get off script just for a second. Can I just for a quick second? Yeah, man, we got a couple minutes here. Yeah, I wanted the people to know, and Gio, I think that's a great topic for the next show, so we can go in depth on that. Uh, but this show is for you guys, for Gio and for Rudy. Uh, I want the listeners out here to understand this. I watched the show earlier today, and uh, Stephen A. Smith was talking about how he's reached over five hundred thousand viewers on his new show, and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. I think this is the best show around. Um, I know they have all that smoke. Uh, Paul George has his podcast. Draymond has his podcast. A lot of people have podcasts. But if you're really talking about an informational show, I think this is it. And um, I think you two guys, man, are a blessing to me. I think this show is going to continue to take off. It's going to only get better. But listeners, please spread the word because I really mean it sincerely. I think this is the best show around. And I'm right here. You see what that says? (laughs) Hey, Sweet Derek, send me a shirt, Derek, because I can't get one from Rudy. Let me, let me, let me <laughs> We're going to make that happen somehow. Where the logo is on the on the screen is right there where your shirt is. So there, you've got a shirt on. Uh, now you do <laughs> right there on that. I'm going to get you a shirt. I, I promise I'll send a shirt out yeah, as I know, soon as I, I can. For I'm you. just I messing with you. I'm just messing. I promise. <laughs> you know what, Derek? I, uh, I appreciate you saying that, man. You know, we've... Uh, We've been at it for a while, for a long while, and we're enjoying it a lot more these days. Bringing you on has been probably the absolute biggest blessing that we can ask yeah. for at Sweep the League because you give us a lot more insight than a lot of these other guys have. And you know what? Like, we're not former players like Up in Smoke or and all, the, all the smoke and all that. We're not former players, but we're guys that – studied the game so much and not just basketball we studied so many of the other sports that 
having you on helps us a whole lot more because we get the perspective that we would never be able to get from anyone else. Nobody would take us serious without you. Let's put it that I way. I take you guys very serious. I think you're top of the charts. Hey, both of you. I, I remember the first episode I was with on with Derek, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, is this George Garvin's brother? And it, it took me a second because I know that I, I, I've seen videos with him and with Rudy, and I said, wait a minute. This is George Gervin's brother. I had the opportunity to sit down with someone who played in the NBA. Mm -hmm. His brother played in the NBA, right? Just a completely different perspective. And also my favorite NBA basketball kind of era, even though it wasn't being long in, there was the 90s and obviously the 2000s as well. But we do definitely appreciate you, Derek. Now, I love you guys. And I'm hoping I can start getting some of these um, current players on here. Um, I, I met, you know, I spent last weekend with uh, Kay Cunningham and, the Detroit Pistons and Derek Coleman and Jalen Rose, man, who I was personally the first time I ever met him uh, face to face. So just mm -hmm. spending time with him and those guys and Steve Smith, I think is going to uh, just lead us to better things for this show. And hey, Derek Coleman was uh, onward and upward. Derek yeah. Coleman, I I love his game. He was a guy who could shoot the ball really well, post up, fade away, whatever. That guy in today's time, Derek. Derek Coleman would be a big problem because yeah, his ab his ability to shoot the ball and and also being a lefty, right? Like it's it's just a different different in, in today's NBA. He has a very high skill set, um, and that's what people. I'm sorry that a lot of people missed out on that, but this show though, you two guys, man, I mean that. I think y'all top of the line. I actually get excited. I look forward to being with you guys. And Rocky, that goes for you too, my man. Rock's not yeah, here on the day today. But I'm giving a shout out to Rocky. Yeah, man. We've, you know, over the years, we've assembled a really good cast. And I'm going to give a shout out to, because Derek and I know him. Gio knows him as well. But guys behind the scenes, like uh, Shamaya on the beats. I mean, he does a lot of our producing. Mark, uh, Stats himself, he helps out everything. Shout out to even Candice uh, Avila Garcia. She was on our show for a while there. She continues to help us out. We've got a lot of behind the scenes people that people don't see. Um, I'm the ugly mug in the camera and these guys make myself look beautiful on camera when they join me, but all these people behind the scenes as well, Joe Garcia from Album City Podcast Network. We got a lot of great people behind us, but definitely Derek, th this show is going to keep growing. We, we anticipated Tim Gonzalez is always in here as well. He's got a flashback question for you, Derek on Friday. So he's going to save it for Friday show to get a flashback because we do flashback Friday. That's our new uh, segment that we're getting into but one flashback that we're going to get into Friday as well is I want to give a quick shout out because I saw the documentary again this is the third time I've seen it I'm a big documentary guy when it comes to basketball I've seen Mr. Chibs Kenny Anderson I, I love that documentary very very good documentary I've seen that probably about 10 times already uh, I've I've actually DM'd with Kenny a little bit so I'm hoping that one day we can get Kenny Anderson on the shows we talk another about good basketball player just a, a guy who can just a legend especially Ooh, in that legend. region if, if you oh, can't yeah. get him if you can't get him let me know so i can uh text derek coleman because derek sent me some him uh, and derek yeah him and derek are this friends. weekend so yeah if you can't get him let me know and then we try to move forward and see if we can get some help and get him on definitely the show. i know you i know you also reached out to mark price so we're gonna let that out we're trying to get a hold of mark price as well to get him on um but the documentary I'm talking about, go check it out. It's called A Kid from Coney Island about Stefan Marbury. That's one of the greatest, I guess, triumph to, tri to tribulation back to triumph again. Because what I loved about the documentary was that a lot of people didn't see Stefan Marbury, top of the game. One of the best guards in the league for a while there. Obviously came up from, you know, from Coney Island, from New York, street ball, I mean, just everything to get to the yes, NBA. Sir. To have it crash down, you know, in his New York days, uh, I believe it was under Larry Brown. I mean, just the stuff he went through to revitalize that career. And Derek, this is something I want to talk to you about on Friday, how you go overseas and that career where you were like, you know what? I'm so thirsty to be that guy in basketball. He made it happen in China. I mean, he's the biggest guy in China. And those are the kind of inspirational stories that I love from basketball players when they are at their lowest point and they make it happen again. Uh, I completely agree. And listen, would have loved to see him and Kevin Garnett longer, right? They only spent three years together. Yes. He ends up getting shipped out. There's obviously some things that happened there, but would have loved to see him with the Timberwolves 
extend that because I definitely would have loved to see Marbury, right? Kevin Garnett, Sprewell, and that group that went to the Western Conference Finals to play the Lakers. It, Zerbiak. It, 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 could, it could have been, yes, yeah. Sir. Well, these are back. Could have been different, but an NBA legend is someone who grew up in New York. I mean, he's a legend. Yeah. So I definitely want to talk to you about that, Derek. You got a quick any any last words, Derek, before we uh, close this show out? No, I said what I had to say. I just want more people to start uh, tuning in and asking questions. Um, Tim mm-hmm. sent me a friend request, Tim Gonzalez, a few days ago, and I accepted the friend request. Uh, and I don't mind answering questions, a lot of those questions, but I'd rather answer them on the air here with you guys. So, I, 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 hey, I welcome all questions, all listeners. We just want to build this show. Yeah, we will continue to build it. Tim actually sent me a friend request, too, uh, a while back, and I accepted it because I knew he wanted to give me help for the Tar Heels every single chance he gets. <laughs> and also, we're going to be on TikTok very soon. Uh, yes. We're going to try, oh, try to get creative on there, upload some some good conversation of us and also some older NBA, which me and Rudy and Derek obviously enjoy. So, yeah, man, this TikTok thing is going to be crazy. I'm, I'm an old man trying to figure out this TikTok <laughs> thing. So Gio's going to have to help me. Gio, Shamaya, and also stats. Those guys are going to have to help me. And I know Derek's smart enough to do it, so he can definitely do it uh, on his own. But hey, man, we are out of time again. It is Wednesday. Tomorrow we're shooting for the mock draft guy to be on the show from X. Answer all your NFL mock drafts. Caleb Williams, uh, baby. Caleb Williams is terrible, Gio. Uh, Mario Cavazos, I will get to your question tomorrow. I did not forget it. Will three quarterbacks be selected in the top 10? Uh, yes. Um, unfortunately, yes. Some um, three, three quarterbacks will go. We're going to get into that tomorrow with the mock draft guy. Hopefully, we can secure him. If not, Derek will be back Friday. Gio and I will be back on tomorrow. God forbid nothing happens with the computer again, but we will be back on tomorrow talking a lot of NFL draft stuff. We want to get into this Caleb Williams debate, how Gio is fully in love with Caleb Williams, and I'm not. So for Derek, for Coach Gio, Rudy Campos Jr., for everybody behind the scenes that sweep the league, we appreciate you joining in. And again, until we sweep the league again next time, we'll see you later, knuckleheads. You guys have a great day. Gio, have a great day, my man. Take